Hello, everybody. It's Cindy Ingram. And before I start with my word of the year update, number two, I am going to whine the fact that I did this whole recording with no audio. And then I did about five minutes of the recording without having clicked record the second time I tried. So this is take number three. We're going to do this right this time. I'm not going to go on Facebook Live for this one because I'm scared of the audio thing that happened. So I'm just going to upload this video onto Facebook. I will also put this up on the podcast. So if you're listening and you want to watch, head over to Facebook. If you're watching and want to listen, head over to the podcast Art and Self uh, with Cindy Ingram on any of your podcast players. So today I, you know, my word of the year is artist. And in last week's update, I gave you sort of a backstory on why I chose that word and what it means to me to call myself an artist and how it feels really uncomfortable <laughs> to call myself an artist and to keep myself really um, engaged in that word of the year for the whole year. My plan is to do these weekly updates, uh, weekly ish. The last one was on a Tuesday. Today's a Thursday. It's really going to be um, inconsistent. So apologies if you like consistency <laughs> of time and date. That's not what's something I can do right now. Um, and I had this whole thing about what I was going to talk about, which was this art journal page I made and like the how it how I started and how it ended and how that was about the creative process. But I will talk about that sure I'm sure another day. But what I is more pressing um that feels like it um really impacted my week this week is how artists manage their moods and how important rest and rejuvenation and self-care is to artists if they are going to continue creating, continue to have longevity as an artist, continue to keep their creativity um, without forcing it, um, all of that. So what happened with me is last week I was on fire. <laughs> I, I just recently had COVID. I finally was feeling better. My family was back, you know, the kids were back at school. Everybody was kind of okay. And I was really loving my work. I was writing this chapter in my book that compares my burnout to the um, the post the artwork from the movie poster for Jaws. And I was having such a blast with that. Like all the, all the ocean metaphors and things are just giving me life. I was having so so much fun. I was so much having so much fun coaching um, and all the things that I do. Um, with my work. And then over the weekend, it's like, I just, I had a, a real, like a, a switch flipped and I went from being so happy and joyful and excited to feeling really down, depressed, incredibly low energy, incredibly low motivation. My ADHD was like out of control. I couldn't keep a thought straight. I mean, it was just really drastic and it felt physical because I didn't have any, there was no trigger for it. It just happened. And I, well, any trigger that I noticed, I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute what that, what I think it was. Um, and it was, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty dramatic. And so, you know, Monday comes around, Tuesday comes around and I'm feeling really low. I'm not being, I'm not able to work as much as I normally can. Um, everything felt really hard. You know, my writing practice, I have a, a writing group that I'm in. I go every day. Um, it's a commitment I made to myself when I joined it back in April that I go every single time. I schedule everything around it. I don't ever schedule anything on top of it. It's sort of a non-negotiable. Um, very rarely do I have to miss. Um, so I go anyway. If I Whether I feel like it or not, I go anyway. And that's a big lesson I've learned is that if I want to get this book written, I have to, I have to continue to work on it, whether I feel like it or not, you know, and working on it looks different. But I think I talked about that last week. So anyway, I show up to writing practice really struggle. I'm at the end of the chapter. And I always struggle end of chapters. I don't, I don't know how to wrap it up. And then somehow I get in my head that I have to tell the whole book and the whole resolution of everything I talked about and how I cured everything I talked about, you know, in the last paragraph of the book and the last paragraph of the chapter. And so it always kind of, I always get a little agitated at the end of the chapters. Um, and sometimes I'm just like, oh, I, I can't. I'm going to come back to this and I move on. Um, so I was at the end of the chapter and I was kind of struggling with that on writing practice. And then um, 
I go to my coach, Allison Crow, which you, if you listen to the podcast, you've heard her on the podcast before. Amazing episode. You should listen to that. And I was talking to her about this and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. And, and she was really resonating too, because she also has a, a newly diagnosed ADHD like I do. And we were kind of talking about how it feels and how, you know, it's hard to, um, when it's, when it is, how it can be completely debilitating. And, you know, I, I was just feeling so tired too. And then I remember telling her, I was like, my subconscious is working on something and I don't, I don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, I, I was like, I feel like it's, it's doing something. Um, and then, so like when I try in my conscious mind to do something different, it's just like, no, I can't cause I'm already working on this other thing. And so it just wouldn't let me do anything else. Um, it was really strange. It just, I just had that feeling, but then I didn't know what it was because it's my subconscious. You can't see, you can't tell what's going on back there all the time. So I was experiencing that. And then in my call with, with Allison, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I know what it is. It's, it's my book. Um, I was hearing weird dog noises. That's okay. Okay. Um, uh, it was the book. I was like, oh, <laughs> it's not the first time this has happened, but sometimes what I'm writing about in the book shows up in my life. Um, like, for example, I was writing a chapter once about shame and suddenly I'm noticing shame everywhere around me. I see it everywhere I go. I notice it in people. I notice it in myself. I start to feel it more because I'm thinking about it more. Um, and then when you're writing something about your past, and you, you want to convey how it felt and you want to really articulate the impact of how it felt to, to feel that you have to, you, you don't do that with your brain. You don't do that with, this is what I remember it feeling like. It's like, no, you feel it in your body and then you put yourself into that position and you feel the sensations in your body. You feel the emotions, you experience it. It's like you relive it so that when you write it down it comes from that place that real place so that it can come across to the to the reader or the viewer um if you're talking about art and so i know you know that happened it's happened before and i don't know why i didn't notice that it happened again this time because my chapter was about burnout and i'm writing about how I was burnt out, how I couldn't work, how my work was causing anxiety, how um, I stopped doing things like writing and, and looking at art and things that were like really core to my foundation. You know, I'm writing about being depressed and <laughs> about having burnout. And then I then am like, why am I feeling so burnt out? And I'm like, oh, it's because I'm writing about it. And so that, that helped just to recognize it, um, that that was what was happening. And um, once I recognized it, I was able to give myself a little bit more compassion and grace for it. I mean, I, I do tend to judge myself a lot. I'm going to get into that in a minute, but, um, that was, uh, that's what was happening. And then, um, had a call with my book coach, Heather, who also is on the podcast, also amazing. Um, and she brings a lot of compassion to the writing process. That's what our podcast was about. And it was also about, um, but that's what her business is. It's like um, a compassionate approach to writing. And it's a really beautiful process. She's really good at it. Um, and recognizing that there are days like this. There are days where you're irritated. There are days where it's, you're sky high and so excited. And there's days where you can't get anything done. There's, you know, there's, it's, it's every day as a creator is different. And it's about allowing that. And it's about, um, creating the space for that, um, learning what works for you and creating that sort of safe place in your creation. So, you know, as I was mentioning in our call, I was like, yep, yeah, I was feeling the emotions of the book. I realized that's what it was getting me down. And she was like, I wish I could say that it wasn't going to happen again. She was like, but it's going to happen again all uh, pretty much every time. And I was like, oh, good. <laughs> that's great. Um, because I mean, it just, you, you kind of think about this myth of like this 
expressing your feelings on the canvas or on paper or, or whatever. And then it's like, when those feelings leave you, when you express them in writing or on, on an image, they still are in your body. You're still feeling them. And it's so easy for me to tap into those feelings in the past too, because my body, your body remembers, you know, it's like it remembers how it feels to be anxious and, 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 and burnt out and depressed and in shame and like it, it knows. And so I can put myself back there, but it's how do I get myself back out when I'm done? That is something I really need to, to focus on and be aware of. Like, um, that's a question I'm going to ask myself is in the future, how can I kind of notice this sooner and be prepared for it and um, give myself the space I need to recover? Um, because honestly, it feels really self-indulgent, um, especially in our culture that is so hyper fixated on productivity. You're not, you're not productive. I mean, you're not value if you don't have, um, if you're not producing, you're not, um, you know, time spent equals money. And so like, if you're spending five hours playing Minecraft, which I'm sure I did in, you know, in one sitting in the last few days, like, uh, then you're not a valuable person and, and you're being self-indulgent and you're being lazy and, and all the things. And so it's like, but there is, it's, in, it's necessary for an artist who is creating something big and powerful and meaningful to care for the repercussions of putting so much of your inner self out onto the, onto the page, onto the canvas, onto the dance floor, or what, you know, whatever it is that you're, your art form. Um, that, you know, what art is, is inherently this human thing. And it is an expression of your humanity. It's an effort to um, like open yourself up and be seen. It's an effort to um, help someone else feel seen. It's, you know, there there's so many reasons for making art and so many different artists do, you know, create art in different ways. But to me, art is, um, an expression of, of humanity and humanity is the wide range of feelings um, and emotions. So I have uh, a quote which, that I don't think I read yet to you. I read it twice already, but <laughs> not on this recording. Um, it's from Anne Lamott from Bird by Bird, which is an amazing book um, about writing. I, feel, I can't remember if I already said this. Um, it's okay. It's fine. You can hear it twice. If, if, if you're hearing it twice, maybe you needed to hear it twice. So anywho, uh, it's a book about writing. Excellent book. There's a lot of fiction writing stuff in there, which wasn't necessarily relevant to me, but it would be, I mean, if you're a writer at all, I think you would find it really um, a great read. And even you can apply, um, apply it to art as well. But she says, my writer friends and they are legion do not go around beaming with quiet feelings of contentment. Most of them go around with haunted, abused, surprised looks on their faces, like lab dogs on whom very personal deodorant sprays have been tested. And that's really what, like, going back and reading that quote, I just finished the book on over the weekend. But going back, I always highlight on my Kindle, which then transfers over to Goodreads, and then I can go back and read through my quotes, which um, things I highlighted, which I really like to do. But that's really what it felt like. Like, I felt haunted the first half of this week. I felt um, agitated. I felt like there was something I didn't see and something I didn't know. And it was just really uncomfortable. Um, and yeah, I know now. <laughs> and then today I finished the chapter and then I feel great. So, I mean, that's crazy. That's not crazy. It's wild. I don't know. I'm trying, to, I'm trying not to say the word crazy so much. Um, okay. And then there was another great quote that I found. Well, not that I found, that I used when I used to teach abstract expressionism, which was from Mark Rothko. And Mark Rothko is a very misunderstood art, artist from, you know, a lot of people see his art and they're just like, you know, oh, it's just colors. I can do that. And they roll their eyes. But there is a lot of depth to his work that I think a lot of people don't see. And this quote by Mark Rothko, I love it because it really shows his intentions. 
And he says, the fact that people break down and cry when confronted with my pictures shows that I can communicate with basic those basic human emotions. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when painting them. So, you know, that feeling, you know, he was fully feeling it. And when he was done painting, that feeling just didn't vanish, that it was still there. And so how do artists um, manage that? And um, I believe that I can be an, a happier, happy person. <laughs> I can be a whole, a well-adjusted person and still be an artist. I don't have to be tortured all the time. That, but yes, I, there will be moments where I'm tortured, but that I can um, feel good too. And so that's something I'm thinking about is how can I, I strike that balance? And it is something I've been working on my entire life because I am a creative person. I am a creator. Even when I was building my business, at the time, I think I didn't call it being an artist. I didn't even necessarily call it, excuse me, my eye is itching. I didn't necessarily even call it creativity. Um, I, I called it being smart, <laughs> but I think creative, I've learned that like, oh wait, it's creativity is kind of more what I'm all about. That's a whole other topic. So I'm not gonna go there. Um, and then it just, I found one other thing that I was just kind of Googling around and I found a study that was published in the, the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity, and the Arts Journal. And it's called Patterns of Psychological Vulnerabilities and Resources in Artists and Non-Artists. And so they, they did a test. They found a group of artists. I think they were mostly college instructors. So these were their creative people. <laughs> And then they found a group of non-creative people. I don't, you know, pulled them from other professions and things. People who don't have any arts training or arts background, people don't call themselves artists. And they measured what they called psychological vulnerabilities, which are things like anxiety, depression, and stress. And then they measured their psychological resources, which they labeled, or which are like, well-being, ego, resilience, and hope. So you've got like the the positive side and then the more sort of, um, or in the, and then like negative side, uh, like the quote unquote negative emotions and quote unquote positive emotions, which I don't, I think that's a whole thing that's, I don't, I don't know about the term negative emotions for any emotion, but um, they didn't put negative and positive in this study. Uh, but what they found is fascinating that artists, the artist group, had higher incidences of psychological vulnerabilities, more anxiety and more stress. And they, but they also had more evidence of psychological resources. So they had higher thing, higher um, uh, resilience and hope and things like that. So not only are they like they're experiencing their low lows, but they're all experiencing the high highs. And so I think that's fascinating. And I think that it's true. <laughs> like if you go from last week to this week, there was one point I was driving down the road last week and I just had this huge smile on my face and I was like so excited. I was like, this is great. You know, like yay art, yay life, yay work. And then like, a few days later, I'm like way down. And so it's, it's, that is a it's a trip to go through you know that those roller coasters of feelings and I think for a lot of my life I was trying to shut that out I was trying to not feel the bad feelings but I also in suppressing the bad feelings suppressed good feelings too you know like I was scared to show excitement I was you know like there it was like I could only stay here because I'll be judged either way. You know, that was a whole other thing, not related to being an artist. So um, really fascinating, really is. And it gave me a lot of things to think about in terms of, you know, how do I still show up even though I am experiencing this? How do I soothe myself? How do I care for myself to recover when I am having to go through some rough content? 
And then what support do I need? You know, I have my, um, my coach, I have my book coach and I have my therapist <laughs> went back to therapy because of the last incidents of this happening in the book when I was writing about shame, like that was really hard to get through. And I was like, I think I need more support even. So I started to go see her. So I'm looking forward to seeing her. She hasn't, I haven't talked to her since this, all of this happened this week. Um, so yeah, how can I get through it? What support do I need? And then, um, yeah, how can I recognize that it's happening? And, um, sooner and prepare for it that um so i think that was all there i think there was one yeah i think in my earlier video i talked about how the stuff i'm writing now is stuff that i haven't really put a story to i haven't processed fully yet because it's more recent and so it's been really agitating to kind of go through and um, make make sense of the time that i'm talking about um Pick, you know, like find the layers and all of that. Like it's it's it's, a, it's really deep work um, creating this this book. So um, I would love to hear from you on your thoughts on managing those um, emotions as an artist, and um, I think celebrating them too. That's another thing that I want to do is that I do like the capacity to feel and the capacity to be human and also communicate my humanity, I think is an ult is, a, is a gift to the world. And I know I have received that gift from so many people. So I, I hold that, that, um, I hold that to such a high, high place of reverence. Um, and so going through the process myself has made me even more connected to the authors of the books I read, the artists of the, the artworks that I connect with. Um, so that's really cool too. So thank you so much for listening and or watching this video. Um, hopefully the third time is a charm and everything goes okay with posting this. Um, but I will be back next week or so for another update. So thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I will talk to you later. Bye.